Let us bow our heads in prayer. Our gracious God, we ask, Lord, for your presence with us. Lord, we are assured that, you, that you're present with us, because you tell us in your holy word that whether twos and threes are gathered in your name, that you will be among us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, Lord. And we pray that you would give each and every one of us a quiet mind as we listen to your word for the short time that we are here. Help us, Lord, to leave the cares and the worries of this world aside so that we might be blessed by hearing your word. Bless us now, forgive us our sins, for Jesus' sake. Amen. If you'll turn with me now to the passage that we read out of the Gospel according to Mark chapter 5, I'd like to share a few thoughts with you on uh, verses Mark 19, sorry, uh, 20 to 21, so 19 to 20, sorry. That's verse 19, Gospel according to Mark chapter 5. Whoever Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you, and how he has compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. Well, if you had read the previous chapter, we would have seen Jesus demonstrating his power over the wind and the waves. And now we have read how Jesus carries out an exorcism with a man who is possessed by evil spirit, and that his name is Legion. Here we have our Lord Jesus Christ demonstrating his power over humanity, and an un untamable force. We have no idea how many evil spirits possess this man, but we know that the word legion, that it was used at the time to describe a group of Roman soldiers numbering about 6,000 men. And earlier in Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28, let us read them. Mark chapter 1 at verse 21. Sorry, Mark chapter 1 at verse 21. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogues and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them to, as one having authority and not as, as, as the scribes. Now there was a man in their, in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you not come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came to him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? With what authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the regions, around Galilee. Well, the difference in the situation that we were looking at just now is much worse. It is much more serious. And it seems to be, it seems to us that if this incident took place after the previous miracle over nature, when he claimed, when he calmed the winds and the waves. Now, let us imagine, if that is the case, what an eerie picture we have. This would have happened in the evening. And can you imagine? Here we have the power of God triumphing over the forces of evil. The light of the world, Jesus Christ, the light of the world, is dispelling darkness and a transformation that epitomizes the very core 
and the purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ has taken place. In the glory of this incident and the clear evidence of the power of God, there are many questions that we could be asking. And we have to admit, they would be very difficult to answer, if not maybe impossible for us to answer them. We know for a fact that Mark's gospel is the shortest, but we know that his record of this miracle is longer and more detailed than either Matthew or Luke. We are told that Jesus and his disciples had they arrived at the region of the Gennesaret. His disciples were with him, but we don't know if they got out of the boat or not. It doesn't matter they, to us. Because they never took any part in this incident as far as the Bible tells us. Now, this area they were in, it was well known for its caves, its tombs, and it was from one of these tombs that Legion made its way towards Jesus. He made his way towards them as he seen Jesus leaving the boat that himself and the disciples had been in. So, what do we know about Legion? Well, the fact that he, that he lived in the tombs tells, tells us about the state of his mind. He must have been a poor man. He must have been a man that was to be pitied. He lived on his own, well away from society and people in general. What a sad and sorrowful picture of a man he was. He was out of control day and night. We believe that he was roaming the hills and roaming and in, in and out of the caves just like a wild animal. He was an enemy not only to himself, but to the others, because he was gripped by an uncontrollable evil power. Many of the local people would have been afraid of him. He would have been an embarrassment to the local community. And we know that he wasn't in any food state to mix with society. If we were to look at Mark's, Mark's, Matthew's gospel, he makes a valid point that Legion was a violent man. And he says that he was so violent that no one could get anywhere near him. It is helpful for us to understand why the people tried to bind him with chains. But imagine, even the chains had no effect on him or little effect on him. His dynamic strength must have been so powerful that he could even break the chains. What a frightening person he must have been. Can you imagine seeing somebody snapping chains? You would be frightened of him, wouldn't you? He even threatened people. He self-harmed himself. He tried to take his own life, and could you blame him? His life must have been unbearable because he was hated, he was feared by most people. But one thing that we must always keep in mind He was loved by God, even in his present state. God had a great love for him. And in the state he was in, that is not the way God intended him to be. God's image had been distorted. Why? Because he was under the influence of Satan. 
because of his appearance and behavior, the people round about knew that he was out of his mind. They tried to help him, but we know that he was beyond human help, but not God's help. He was not beyond God's love or God's compassion. Jesus Christ cared for him. We are told in verse 6 that Jesus saw him from a distance. And we know that it's only Jesus that could bring about his release from Satan. Let us just think for a moment. How many of us seen Jesus from a distance and told him to stay there? Well, let us take a lesson from even Legion. What did he do? He ran at the feet of King Jesus and he fell on his knees before him. And let us remind ourselves that any person that runs to Jesus and stays there will never be disappointed. What a contrast we have here between the religious leaders of the time, with all their knowledge, with all their false spirituality, they could often stare at Jesus in the eyes, and they could listen to his gracious words, and yet they were not willing to believe. What a difference we have here. We have legion running to Jesus and falling on his knees and shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? What do you want with me? Well, can we say it in another word? What do you have in, what do you and I have in common? What are you doing here? I have nothing in common with you. Well, they didn't have anything in common at that time, and the distinction could have not have been any greater. By using the word Jesus, Son of the Most High God, the one that is possessed to showing us that the evil spirits, that they were aware of the true identity of who Jesus was. In Mark chapter 1, we could have read, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know you who you are. You are the Holy One of God. And the unclean spirits, wherever they saw him, they fell down before him and Christ cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. In this case, Legion acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God. He has already fallen at his feet. He has submitted to Jesus. He has submitted to the superior power of a holy God. He is also looking for assurance that Jesus would not torture him because he is so possessed by evil spirits who are opposed to our God. In verse 8, we see Jesus has already commanded the evil spirits to come out of the man but at that time without any effect. It is also clear to us that the man is in a state of fear because there is a war raging within him. And like us all, he wants to be freed from the power of Satan, from the powers of darkness, The Bible tells us in Ephesians, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers of darkness 
and against the spiritual forces of evil. Note what he said when Jesus asked him a question, or asked him the question, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he went on to beg Jesus on behalf of the, of the evil spirits not to send them out of the area. He knows now that he is defeated and that he is surround, sur, surrendering to a holy God. Why is he asking not to be sent out of the area? I wonder, did these demons, did they dwell in certain areas? I'm sure in this case they would have felt at home. It was an area associated with death, desolation, and destruction. I wonder if it was a place that the evil spirits would have felt at home. But why was he so persistent? He asked Jesus again and again. If he is so full of the evil spirit, is he so full of these influence that are there, are they coming through his voice? Do the, these evil spirits, they don't want to be homeless. And at this very point, the herd of pigs come on the scene. And as the evil spirits make the request known through legion, they beg Jesus that he would send them into the pigs. And that remem let us remember that this it's a, it's a Jewish situation. This would, be no, this would be no problem to them. The pigs were classed as unclean, unclean animals. They were not allowed to eat the meat of them. This was a Gentile situation, and it would have no effect or loss upon the Jewish life in the area. Can you imagine the situation? Remember that this really took place. This is not a made-up story. Jesus commands the Holy Spirit to come out of the man that was possessed. And they went on to possess the 2,000 pigs that were in the area. But no, they didn't get their own way. They didn't get their own way with Jesus. They were looked to be relocated, but they didn't bargain for their destruction. We just read there that rushing down the steep bank, the pigs were drowned in the lake, and two things happened here. Legion was released from the power of evil. They were as masters at one time, but now he was free he was rescued from the power of Satan with all its destructive and degrading influence. And not only had they been delivered from these spirits, but he had been delivered from these spirits, but the evil spirits were also destroyed. Their new home within the pigs were short-lived. Their end was swift and complete by the power of of our Jesus. What do we have here? We have here a marvelous picture of the Satan's kingdom being plundered and his kingdom crumbling. This was a battle with one victor in mind. It was never in doubt for the promise was given to us in the Bible that he that is in you is greater than he 
who is in the world. When Jesus, when he had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man, they had no option. They had to obey, even though he had meant their end. Back in Mark chapter 1, 27, we read that when Jesus came out, cast out the demons from the man in the synagogue, the people said in response, what is this? What is going on here? What new doctrine do we have here? Who gave this man the authority? You have seen yourself he is commanding even the evil spirit, the unclean spirits to come out. And they obey him. And then we have the men that were looking after the pigs. They went into the surrounding areas to tell the people what had happened. And when these people came out to see what had happened, they would have noticed two things. I'm sure the first thing they would have noticed, the pigs had gone. 2,000 pigs had gone. Would they have been asking, what about the men that were looking after these pigs? What's going to happen to them now? I wonder if some were saying that Jesus was insensitive to the needs of these animals. And what about the owners of the pigs? Will they be compensated? Some would ask if his actions were unethical. Yes, we could say that they were good and relevant, all these questions. I don't suppose humanly we can, cannot but help to think about them. And yet, as frail humans, we would fail to find a, an acceptable answer. It would be impossible for us. Remember that Mark is telling this story exactly as it is. He is making sure that the relevant details are recorded about what actually happened. And the lessons are clear in relation to the kingdom and the presence or the power of a holy God. He is not making any attempt to provide us with any information as to what happened to the men as the owners of the pigs. What he is telling is something else more important. He is telling us about a compassionate Jesus, a holy Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. If the presence of the pigs was the first thing they would have noticed, surely, surely, the second thing they would have noticed was this transformed man. We are told in verse 15 that this man had been violent and that he was scary beyond belief. And now what? There he is, standing, dressed in his right mind. What a transformation. What a glorious miracle. What an exhibition and demonstration of the power and the purpose of our God. No greater change could take place in any living person. The only way that we can put it is that legion was transformed by the power of a holy God. He is now in his right mind. He is in control of himself. He is rational. 
and sensible. He has received a miracle of grace. Why? He met with King Jesus. He met with Jesus. He is now in a fit state to mix and to have fellowship with humanity. He is able to enter into fellowship with God. And what a wonderful picture of salvation this must be to us. Not one of us here today were so bad as this man was outwardly anyway. Yet the need for trans transformation and reconciliation to God are just as necessary for every one of us today. You know that the Bible tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. In verse 25 in Romans 3, whom God sent forth a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in, in His forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed by every single one of us. Now, how did the people respond to this life-changing event? Well, just go to the Bible, and it tells us that they were afraid. They pleaded with Jesus not, not to stay with them, but to leave their area. Here was evidence that God was at work in their town. It was straight, straight, stared him right in the face. Something amazing and wonderful was happening. And it had changed a man's life. And yet, they wanted rid of the cause. They wanted rid of our Jesus. Now, has anything changed in all these generations? Nothing. The world is still trying to get rid of Jesus. We see the evidence of it every single day. But He will prevail. <clears throat> yes, they said, we don't, we don't want this man to be our king. What do you want with me? Jesus, Son of the Most High. That's what he said to him a few moments ago. But what is he doing now? He is begging Jesus to take him with him. He is begging Jesus to take him into the boat with him. Why? Well, because he is now a believer. And he wants literally to follow Jesus. <clears throat> what a lovely picture have you here. What a lovely picture we have. <clears throat> but then we look <clears throat> and we find out that Jesus has other plans for him. Instead of taking them with him into the boat, he tells them, you go away to your families and friends, and you tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Tell them that he had mercy on you. Now, can we imagine? This man walks into his village he walks into his family home and telling them 
he has been transformed in mind, body, and soul. But wait a minute. Does he have to tell them? Do you not think they would have noticed the change in his life? For once, legion was among the tombs. And where is he next? He is at the feet of King Jesus. We know that legion was bound by chains. And here he is, enjoying complete freedom. He was wild. He was out of control. And now he is in his right mind. He was once unclothed. And now he is dressed. We know that at, at, one, at one time he was distant from man and God. And now he is near to both. But let us keep in mind that this man was no more deserving of the grace of God than any of us. But what did Jesus tell him? Go and tell them that I had mercy on you. Go and tell them how much I love you. Well, as we close, being obedient to Jesus and full of the joys of the Lord, this man went home and he began to witness that Jesus had done for him. The Bible tells us that he began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And the word Decapolis refers to a region containing Ten cities. Legion had become a true missionary. He began to spread the testimony and the grace of God. And no wonder the people were amazed. Well, there are many, many lessons we could take from this story. But maybe we mentioned one or two. We learn that Jesus will accept us no matter our condition when we accept him as our own personal Savior. And we also learn that it is impossible for the believer to avoid the challenge of go and tell all that Jesus had done for them. And as we close, we pray that it is the will of God that he would Grant us boldness so that we can tell a lost world about Jesus as well. Amen. May the Lord bless to us these thoughts. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you allowed us to share the gospel with one another. We thank you for that you left us with that um, parable or story in the Bible about legion. And Lord, with God, we pray that we would learn many lessons from it. We pray, Lord, that each and every one of us would not feel as though Jesus, that we have done so much wrong as Jesus would never accept us. But Lord, we thank you that you are there for us, waiting for us, each and every moment of our lives, to put our hand in your hand. Bless us now, forgive us our sins, for Jesus' sake. Amen. As we close, we'll turn to Psalm 73. Psalm 73, and we'll sing the verses, Mark 24 to 28. Thou with thy counsel while I live will me conduct and guide, and to thy glory afterwards receive me to abide. Whom I in the heavens high, but thee, O Lord, alone, and in the earth whom I desire, 
beside thee. There is none. And verse 24, we'll sing down to the end of the psalm. <coughs> Thy words, thy counsel, while I learn, world me Doxology we find in the letter to Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceedingly joy, to God our Saviour, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. <laughs> 